Bene, buongiorno a tutti e a tutte. Eh, questo è il primo appuntamento del nostro seminario avanzato di eh, semiotica che coinvolge tutti gli studenti e i ricercatori di semiotica dell'Università di Torino, in particolare gli studenti della laurea magistrale e mh, i dottorandi, così come i ricercatori. Eh, tradizionalmente da più di dieci anni a questa parte denominiamo questa serie di incontri incontri sul senso eh, negli anni sono intervenuti diversi relatori sia nazionali che internazionali oggi ehm, eh, mi accompagnano alcuni dei giovani ricercatori del nostro gruppo che conoscerete eh, anche come conferenzieri oltre che come docenti Ehm, a dire Gianmarco Giuliana, Bruno Surace e Simona Stano. I'll switch to English. Uh, <coughs> this um, uh, talks, these meetings uh, will be um, videotaped and uh, uh, they will be available also for uh, those students who are not present here um, today, but uh, also for you uh, in the case where you wanted to access these um, talks again. Uh, for instance, in view of the preparation of your um, exam. Um, indeed, uh, the contents of the various uh, talks that will be proposed during this uh, seminar uh, will also be object of uh, your examination, your oral examination at the end of uh, the course. Uh, now, every year we, s we choose a particular subject for um, uh, this um, Incontri sul senso, meetings on meaning, and uh, this year we have decided to uh, um, work and study, uh, do research, um, present uh, talks on the topic of the face. Now the face is a huge topic. The face is a uh, fundamental interface of uh, uh, human relations and social life. Um, social life uh, would not be uh, possible as we know it if we eliminated uh, the human phase from human everyday interactions. Uh, that is also why on the one hand the phase has become the object of investigation of um, many social sciences, probably all social sciences, uh, many of the humanities, but increasingly so also it has become an object of inquiry for uh, natural sciences, uh, for uh, biology, for neurobiology, for evolutionary theory, and so on and so forth. Um, so it is a very difficult um, object to study. It is a fascinating one because it is uh, tremendously uh, interdisciplinary, uh, but it is also, on the other hand, a, uh, an object uh, uh, in studying which disciplines have somehow also transformed themselves by reflecting on the face, some disciplines have discovered something essential, something new about themselves. Um, this is why we want to uh, somehow also test semiotics um, as a discipline studying the face. Uh, there is already a literature on the semiotics of the face. For instance, there is an Italian scholar whose name is Patrizia Magli. Uh, she used to be a full professor of semiotics at the University of Venice. And she has uh, published uh, a couple of very good books about the semiotics of the face. Now, uh, there is a, a, a literature on the semiotics of the face, but there is also an enormous gap. There is a, an enormous uh, um, a lacuna to fill. Uh, what is this gap? Well, um, semiotics has changed as a discipline, but uh, especially the object of this investigation, the face, has changed enormously too. What does it mean that the face, the human face, has changed, according to you? You can intervene both in Italian or in English as you please. This is a bilingual or trilingual or multilingual uh, sign, you just have to feel comfortable about it. So, what does it mean when I say that the human face has changed throughout history and the human face is particularly changing nowadays? What do I mean by that? Che cosa significa 
che il volto umano è cambiato nel corso della storia e sta cambiando moltissimo ai giorni nostri. Cosa significa secondo voi questo cambiamento? In che senso il volto cambia nella storia? In che senso è molto cambiato ultimamente? Please, oh, prego. Credo sia una questione tecnica prima di tutto. Con l'arrivo della fotografia ci si focalizza un momento statico anche del volto, quindi non è sempre in divenire un ricordo, ma diventa fisso su un supporto, quindi si dà una particolare attenzione estetica anche a questo, perché più avanti sarà sempre quello di puntare. Mm. Uh, altre idee? Any other ideas? Beh, anche per esempio il um, modo in cui la, il volto viene rappresentato. Cioè, um, spesso per esempio ha un certo modo di rappresentare una certa tipografia, è cambiata dal tempo. Vi prego di alzare la voce e fare un intervento così facciamo sentire anche agli altri e anche ai vostri spiegati dentro di me. Yeah, uh, certainly the ways of representing the face have changed throughout history. And certainly, uh, what the first uh, comment uh, uh, pointed out, there has been a, uh, um, a significant impact on the um, ways in which the face uh, is perceived and attributed meaning uh, given by the evolution of the technologies of communication. So the invention of new technologies of communication uh, changes cultures, uh, changes also the perception of the human body and the perception of the human face. But it's not only that, there is a much deeper change that we can witness throughout history um, as regards the face. Uh, do you know what uh, post-speciation means? Uh, post-speciazione, uh, credo sia in, uh, in italiano. The face is according to you a uh, natural, uh, biological, a uh, physiological element of the human body, or it is, on the contrary, a cultural, uh, psychological, semiotic element of the human body. <clears throat> what determines, for instance, the shape of your face, of your own face? Nature or culture? Entrambe. Entrambe? In che modo? parte da una base biologica e poi quella culturale viene proiettata su e modificata in base a molto singolare e individuale. Yeah, there is a, a substratum of the face that is given uh, on the one hand by the um, um, evolution of the human body and the human face throughout uh, prehistory. Um, and uh, at the same time there is also a natural substratum of the human face that is given by genetics. We have, we show the face that we show, we have the face that we have because we are members of the human species, but also because we have inherited uh, a certain genetic code that has also determined the shape of our face. So there is a substratum in the way in which we present our face to the world, but there is also do you think, or uh, you don't, a natural substratum in the way in which we perceive faces? So we have seen that there is something natural in our face. We are members of the human species, so we have this face. We are uh, inheritors of a certain genetic code, so we have this face. But is there something natural also in the way I perceive faces? For instance, uh, when I perceive your faces, my perception of your faces is guided by nature or is it guided by culture? By culture. You see? You say? Sorry? By culture. By culture? Why by culture? <laughs> because, for example, from, starting from our culture, we can perceive with the other, just uh, maybe from the color of the skin. Mm -hmm. Also, if 
if you are good, if you are good looking or not. It depends from our cultural standards. So on. Okay, so uh, we all agree that there is a cultural dimension in the way in which we perceive other human beings' faces. Please. Yeah, I agree with my colleagues, my colleague, but uh, I know about some uh, scientific studies about the uh, fundamental uh, emotion that our face can uh, show, can show uh, such as uh, fear, anger, and uh, happiness, and so on. And uh, if I remember well, there is a uh, um, common way all around the world, all around every single culture, that uh, is um, about the way we perceive others' emotion on the face. Yeah, this is partially true. I mean, it's something that uh, uh, Darwin himself started to study in his uh, uh, biological evolutionary approach to uh, face emotions. You know, Darwin wrote a, an important essay about face emotions. And it is true that there are set certain common patterns in the way in which we express emotions through our faces, but also in the ways in which we perceive emotions. At the same time, there is a deep cultural impact on the extent to which we um, express these emotions uh, to the extent to which we are able to uh, detect them, to interpret them. Um, so, there is an impact of culture, but at the same time, in the way we perceive faces, not only in the way we show our faces to our people, there is also a natural substratum. Why do you think I'm showing to you uh, this uh, photograph of a glass window of a famous shop that all, we all know uh, on uh, Via Roma in, in Turin. Uh, probably you recognize the glass window. The glass window of what important brand? Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton. Very good. Um, so why do you think I am showing this photograph to you as the first picture in my presentation? What is, what is important about the semiotics of the face and the uh, intertwining of nature and culture in both the ways in which we present our face and we receive the faces of others. Do we see a face in this picture? Yes, we do. Although there isn't any face. There isn't any human face. So what is it that pushes, yet, pushes us to recognize a face in this picture? What are the elements, according to you, that um, are fundamental, uh, instrumental uh, for us to recognize the face in this picture. The eyes and the shape of the... Uh, because it's close. <coughs> you know that the uh, face is close and that uh, inside the two eyes, so we can recognize in some way a face. Yeah, very good. I mean, we, we could test this photograph with the common semiotic test of uh, the commutation, commutation test. So we change something on you know, the, uh, the expressive level, <coughs> the expressive plane, and we try to ascertain whether there is a change at the semantic level at the plane of content. So one thing is to recognize some eyes, and another thing is to recognize a face we might, in some circumstances, recognize some eyes without recognizing a face. There are some graphic depictions, paintings, um, comics, and so on and so forth, in which we recognize eyes, two eyes. We even recognize that these two eyes express a gaze. But it is not necessary that, uh, from the fact that we recognize two eyes, results the fact that we recognize a face. So, we can recognize two eyes without a face, but can we recognize a face without two eyes? Yeah. For, sure. For instance, if we eliminate these two eyes from this uh, probably shoe box, um, would, uh, would it be still possible to recognize a face? No. No. But if we, we eliminate the box and we keep just the two eyes, so we can still recognize the eyes or not? Yeah, we can recognize the eyes without the face, but we cannot recognize the face without the eyes. I mean, we might also eliminate the eyes and still recognize the face, 
but we should add something to this box. For instance, a mouth. A mouth. If there was a mouth, we could probably recognize a face, even if there weren't any eyes. So you see, there is a sort of um, uh, perceptual gestalt that allow us to recognize a face uh, in a given uh, a visual context. Uh, and a very uh, interesting question to ask is whether this visual gestalt, this visual pattern, is given to us by nature or by culture. I'm showing to you another interesting picture. The picture, um, two pictures actually. You see on this slide the picture of uh, what? What do we see in these two pictures? Let's start just describing them. What do they represent? There are two trees. And there are two trees in particular, it's not trees. Now let's be more precise. <coughs> what is it? It's trees, but it's a particular part of the tree. It's the trunk of the tree, the trunk. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we recognize the two trunks uh, on a uh, visual background that is partially natural. Uh, in the first case, uh, the, the top picture, and uh, a, probably a, a building, a um, in the second picture, in the bottom picture. Uh, the, the trunk in the bottom picture also has two branches that we can partially recognize. And this also has an impact on our visual perception. But we also see, you were probably going to continue. Mm -hmm. That in the first picture, there are, it looks like a face, a human face, and there are two eyes and one mouth. Mm -hmm. And in the second picture, there are just uh, <coughs> one eyes. Okay. And so. We can recognize a trunk, we can recognize two eyes, uh, can we recognize a mouth in the first picture, the top picture? Yeah, yeah. Same. yeah. So we can recognize not only a trunk, not only two eyes, not only a mouth, not only a face, but also emotions in this face. Yeah. Um, I can see a pain in the first picture. I'm sorry? I can see a pain in the first picture. Yeah, or we can at least, uh, uh, I think, all agree that the emotion that we are recognizing uh, in this trunk, the picture of this trunk, a trunk is probably not a positive one. It's not a positive emotion. It's, some musicians would say that it's a dysphoric emotion. Euphoric, dysphoric. It's a dysphoric emotion. Can we recognize a face um, in the bottom picture? It is more debatable. It is. Uh, not so sure that we recognize a face. But we can probably recognize, like, how many of you tend to uh, consider that these two branches look like arms? We can't, we cannot uh, really recognize a face, but uh, uh, some of us might recognize a body, a monstrous body with an eye in the middle, but no uh, emotion whatsoever. Do we recognize emotions in the second picture, no. bottom picture? No. So we see uh, there is a common phenomenon in these two pictures, but there are also uh, differences. There are similarities and differences. Now, very important question. Has any one of you not recognized two eyes and a face in the first picture, the top picture? Has any one of you not recognized the face? None of you was able not to recognize the face in the top picture. So it means that we were actually compelled, we were obliged to recognize the picture in the uh, top photograph. We cannot choose. There are no alternatives. Now, first class of semiotics. Semiotics is the discipline, the study, the studies, everything that can be used to lie, but it can also be um, characterized in the final as a discipline that studies alternatives. Do we have an alternative when we see the photograph of this trunk and we recognize a face to eyes and mouth and some emotions? We don't have any alternatives. We don't have the option not to recognize a face. What does it mean? It means that since we don't have this option, this is not a semiotic phenomenon. But it is not simply a semiotic phenomenon. 
And if it is not a semiotic phenomenon, it is not a cultural phenomenon either. So what is it if it is not a cultural phenomenon? It's a natural phenomenon. It is a biological drive. It is a biological instinct. We have, we harbor in ourselves, in our perception, in the cognition, in the deep brain physiology of our visual perception, the ability to recognize faces. But this is not only an ability. We are compelled in some circumstances to recognize some faces if a given pattern, visual pattern, manifests itself in the context in which um, we are, in our visual environment. Given a certain visual environment, we are compelled to recognize a, um, uh, a face. Now, look now at the top picture. So what is it? What can you... Noi possiamo anche disassimilare la pareidolia, mm -hmm. cioè capita spesso come dire, di, di compiere l'operazione cognitiva per cui uno vede così un polpo, in realtà o per forza dell'abitudine o anche per un processo cognitivo in cui tu scomponi la gestalt, smetti di, per, di vedere la... Ammesso che sia una pareidolia condivisa come in questo caso ci sono anche, Simone lo diceva prima, casi in cui non tutti in realtà hanno la stessa percezione della pareidolia quindi sì, cioè. in mente gli edifici spesso guardando facciate di edifici qualcuno vi riconosce un volto no. e qualcuno no uh, yeah, these are very important remarks but at the same time um, they uh, encourage us to nuance um, our position on the fact that we are compelled to recognize faces um, I added in some circumstances so uh, there isn't a, a, a specific pattern that uh, when, mani when it manifests itself in the visual environment then we are compelled to recognize faces I mean there are some visual patterns in which the majority the vast majority of people would recognize a face if they are exposed to it. Uh, there are always exceptions and there are always pathologies as well. I mean, there are people who cannot recognize a face even if they encounter a real human face. There is a pathology called prosopagnosia, prosopagnosia uh, that consists exactly in the uh, impossibility to recognize a human face or to I identify someone through exposition to this uh, visual face, please. Uh, I think uh, all that sucks. Uh, uh -huh. with, uh, yes. So the, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Oliver Sacks studied um, the um, uh, prosopagnosia, but also the uh, Charbonnet syndrome, which is uh, uh, somehow related also to pareidolia. Um, there are certain cases in the medical literature, <coughs> in the neurological literature, of uh, patients, early patients, that are um, uh, treated in uh, elderly homes and they are blind, they have become blind because of pathology of the retina, pathologies of the eye, and other kinds of pathologies. And these elderly patients start to see in the blindness in which they are unfortunately immersed some uh, monstrous faces. Some monstrous faces usually with uh, enormous teeth and big eyes. Now, both because these patients are elderly and because they start to question their cognitive abilities, the fact that they are still endowed with the possibility of comprehending things, in many cases they don't talk about these visions. They think that they are uh, supernatural visions, or they think that they are visions given by the fact that they are losing the mind. So they are, on the one hand, very much afraid, because they are thinking of you know, getting uh, dementia. And uh, on the other hand, they are also afraid of communicating these uh, symptoms, describing these visions, to um, doctors, or to nurses, or to relatives. What happens? is actually a very natural phenomenon that has been identified by Charbonnet 
uh, first a uh, physician from uh, 18th century France and then has been studied by many neurologists uh, and also by Oliver Sachs who wasn't a, a, a researcher as much as someone uh, able to popularize neurology. What happens is that when you are immersed in blindness sometimes your brain is so much starving for visual input from the environment that it starts creating visual input, although physiologically there is no perception because there cannot be anyone because you are blind. So you are blind, but you start, you start having visual perceptions, visual patterns in your brain. Your brain is actually lying to you because it works to process those uh, uh, visual inputs, that visual information. So, what happens is that there is a uh, deeply rooted uh, part of the brain that starts producing images, and these images look like visages, look like faces. And this is not casual, of course. This is because, uh, most probably, and this is another uh, demonstration of uh, the natural, the biological, <coughs> dimension of this perception, probably there is a, um, a mechanism, deeply rooted physiological mechanism in our brain that given some uh, visual conditions, perceptual conditions in the environment, pushes us to recognize some faces, but also when there are no visual inputs whatsoever, pushes us to come up with inputs that look like faces in our, let's say, internal visual imagination. So now, the question is, uh, why should we recognize, or should we, uh, uh, in most circumstances, be compelled to recognize an octopus, probably a fighting octopus, probably a, an angry, uh, drunk fighting octopus, and this is, that is just something to hang our coats in a, in a pack. Why are we compelled to see uh, the shape of an animal, and in particular, uh, an animal with a face uh, that also shows emotions on it when we are confronted with this photograph? Because uh, ontologically, this um, object is just a piece of iron that has been shaped the way it has been shaped in order to uh, enable us to hang our clothes on it. And uh, those that we recognize that uh, two eyes are just uh, two turns. So, what is it that compels us to see a face? And why are we compelled to see a face? Why are we compelled to recognize a face, biologically compelled to recognize a face, when we come across a certain visual pattern in the environment? With a, of course, a, an array of nuances, I know there are some visual patterns in which uh, we have to make a certain effort in order to realize that they might represent a face. This is the case of clouds, for instance. You know, we can recognize an animal, a face, uh, two eyes in a cloud, but the visual pattern in that circumstance is not strong enough to compel us to recognize a cloud. So some of us might recognize a cloud, some others might not recognize a cloud, but nevertheless, when someone says and verbalizes the recognition, then the others are compelled to recognize the same. So the problem is with the first recognition, then the verbalization reorients our perception. But in uh, other cases, and this is a very strong case, uh, this strong, uh, and it is not a case, uh, it is not a coincidence that it is the trunk of a tree. It is not a coincidence that it is particularly in a trunk of a tree that we are compelled to recognize the face. And that this um, impulse is so strong. Why is it so strong and why is it so, so strong on a tree? Perché potrebbe essere all'altezza a cui siamo abituati a vedere dei volti. Uh, not necessarily. We don't know exactly uh, what... I mean, it, this element might play a role, but at the same time, we don't know exactly uh, at what height this visual pattern appears. Please. Maybe. I, I don't know if it could be the answer, but I read somewhere, I don't recall it very well, but 
and that uh, we have uh, a neurological structure that is not so uh, evolved. It is uh, well, very ancient, it is very primordial, and uh, this is why we need uh, to recognize faces from around us, us because uh, our prime, primordial uh, brain is uh, um, with the software yes. uh, that, that needs to recognize people around us. It, we live in the exact same way that our ancestors mm -hmm. lived in a pack, a uh, very small uh, pack of 50, 60 people, mm -hmm. uh, males, well, um, uh, warriors and hunters, uh, females were well, um, collectors, battery and fruits collectors, and they were uh, supposed to look, uh, uh, of, uh, look after the uh, child, look after the um, babies of the pack, and uh, looking for others in the savanna, in mm -hmm. the woods, recognize them as a member of the pack. Uh, should mean say salvation in a dangerous environment mm -hmm. uh, full of uh, the um, predators, predators, animals, and so on. So, with this kind of brain nowadays, is uh, we still have this uh, <coughs> this uh, very strong way to look around us, looking for someone. <laughs> Yeah, this is the hypothesis. Uh, I mean, whenever uh, we have the hypothesis that a certain uh, a, uh, perceptual uh, trend, uh, a certain behavior, uh, a certain uh, pattern of cognition is modeled by culture but given by nature, um, the most uh, uh, satisfactory um, biological theory that we dispose of that we can rely on in order to study the presence of this software you know, that ingrained in our brain, in our cognition, is evolutionary theory. So something that is uh, working according to our biological nature must be there because in some phase of our prehistory it has proven adaptive. So those who were endowed with this ability survived more than those who weren't endowed with that ability. Uh, those who weren't endowed with the ability of recognizing a face not on a tree, but in betwixt trees, among trees, were less able to survive because they were less able to detect the possible aggressive face of a predator. So this is why this ability has been selected by evolution and has been handed down generation after generation until nowadays. Now, do we need this skill nowadays? Yes. Do we? Why? Because um, our uh, social lives are based on personal uh, recognition. And you need to know who's who, you need to know who to trust, you need to know who's that person, you need to know that person. Australia is a state, you know, registered, but most of our lives are still based on face to face contact. And, and so it's necessary to be able to spot one space from another yeah. all the time. Ne definitely, we, um, uh, it is necessary for us to uh, be able to recognize the face when we see one. This is very important. But it is important also that we can uh, recognize a face when there isn't necessary one. So it was very important for our ancestors because there were possibly hostile faces hiding among trees and on trunks. But we don't really have any more possibly hostile faces hiding in the jungle. We don't live in the jungle. We don't live surrounded by uh, hiding hostile faces. But we are still endowed with that, with that ability, with that drive actually, uh, obliging us to see faces not only when there are actually human faces in the environment, but also when visual patterns resembling 
human faces in a certain way appear in the environment. Now, we don't need that skill, but that skill is exactly what is happening <coughs> here. Do we see a predator here? Who's the predator? Louis <laughs> Vuitton. is our predator. And uh, why are we the prey? In what way? Way. Yeah, but we can, I mean, we're not compelled to buy a Louis Vuitton, probably most of us could not afford <laughs> buy a Louis Vuitton, but at the same time, uh, there is something deeply compelling in the way in which this glass window is arranged, and there's something deeply compelling, something that derives not only by the culture of <coughs> glass windows, that is a recent culture, it's a culture that starts probably two or three hundred years ago. Uh, up to the 17th century, glass was not even used in human civilization. So there are many new things in this uh, glass window. Uh, shoes, um, packaging, uh, wrapping, uh, glass, glass window, uh, the concept of shopping. All these things are definitely cultural. Their roots can be traced in history. Uh, a few centuries ago, or even a few decades ago, but there is also something primordial. And this something primordial is that when we walk through the aroma, even if we don't pay attention to Louis Vuitton, at some stage, something will actually compel us to look at this glass window, to stare at this glass window, to stop in front of this glass window. Now, a detail I haven't uh, this close to you is that uh, these two eyes were also endowed with little robotic movement, so they were able to open and uh, uh, close their eyelids and also to make some uh, little movements uh, left and right. So there was this uh, accrued element of realism in their representation. Um, so this is an example to say that uh, uh, it is impossible to uh, constantly separate nature and culture. But at the same time, as semioticians, we have to take into account that um, semiotic systems, culture, cultural trends, advertising, and so on and so forth, um, in most cases, shape, model, mold, uh, attribute a cultural meaning uh, and also second nature on something that is part of our first nature. So it is part of our first nature that we must recognize a face in this glass window. But it is of course part of our second nature, the fact that we then stop in front of the glass window, we look at the products, we think about the brand, and so on and so forth. Now, this is going to be one of the topics of our seminar on the semiotics of the face. And this is what I mean also by post-speciation of the face. Um, there are some very interesting um, uh, studies in the literature on the biology of the face that show that even the shape of our face, the shape of our head, has not stopped with natural evolution, but has been constantly uh, changed also by the impact of culture. And I'm not talking about superficial ways of changing our, um, the appearance of our face or the appearance of our head. I'm talking about the fact that in post-speciation, something that is naturally part, it is a natural element of the human species, because of the impact of culture, then it becomes part of the species as well. <coughs> it is a post-speciation <coughs> pattern. Now, Ways in which we can modify the way in which um, we present our face. Uh, ways in which we can communicate through our face. We can um, inject a project of communication uh, into our face. How can we change the meaning of our faces? Intentionally, I mean, project of communication, so intentionally. How can we intentionally modify the meaning of our face? We can cover it with a mask, or we can cover maybe some part with the makeup, mm -hmm. or with the hat, or something else. Okay, first of all, 
we can choose a, a certain combination of strategies of exhibition and occupation. We can decide whether we show our face completely or we hide our face completely or we hide only a part of our face or we show only a part of our face. And this for many different reasons, aesthetic reasons, political reasons, uh, religious reasons and so on and so forth. So, a, a first uh, project of communication uh, can um, um, uh, rely on this dialectics between occupation and exhibition. Now, who nowadays hides his or her face? You don't hide your face to me. Although some of you partially do. For instance, by taking certain postures. By growing facial hair by wearing glasses instead of contact lenses. Uh, of course, you don't intentionally want to hide your face by wearing glasses, but this is the effect of it. You don't intentionally want to hide your face by um, taking certain postures, but this is the result of it. In terms of signification, it is, all, it is also a slight um, uh, minimal <coughs> uh, phenomenon of occultation. But who, what categories of people nowadays intentionally hide their faces? And they hide their faces uh, entirely, systematically, uh, on a global scale. Who hides his or her face nowadays? Someone, for example, who doesn't want to be recognized. A robber, for example. Mm -hmm. Or for uh, any other religious reason. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there are certain domains of activities in which people hide their faces. Um, policemen who fight mafia in Italy usually do not show their faces on TV. Uh, they go around with this uh, very heavy, um, I don't know the name in English, Passa Montagna. <laughs> Please search Passa Montagna. <laughs> thank you. Um, that cover their faces completely. Uh, why they do so? Well, for mainly private security reasons. You know, they don't want to be identified by, by mafia. They, want, they don't want their actions as policemen to be connected with the fact that they have family, they live in a certain neighborhood, and so on and so forth. Um, other domains of illicit activity also compel people not to show their faces. Uh, of course, robbers. Um, certain religious trends also um, choose a strategy of occupation instead of a strategy of exhibition. Now, this is very complicated and it's very delicate as a subject because uh, on the one hand you have people who interpret, for instance, the veil, the nita, uh, the uh, burka, and so on and so forth, different uh, degrees of occultation also through different uh, uh, categories of um, veiling, uh, which is an important element of the traditional dressing code in certain Arabic cultures and also in certain Islamic cultures. Um, many interpret them as a uh, strategy of resistance. So given the global trend of showing constantly the body and the face of especially female human beings and also to commercialize those faces uh, and to commercialize those bodies for marketing principles then we oppose that trend by uh, hiding our faces by hiding our bodies by hiding our fashion expressions on the other hand some other interpretations say no this is just an imposition of a patriarchal hegemonic mindset that he uses the bodies and the faces of women in order to express a certain religious ideology. So, more generally, we're not going to go into this problem now, now during this, this uh, talk, but more generally, according to the visual culture in which you are, but also according uh, to the religious culture in which you are, um, strategies of occupation or strategies of exhibition of the human face become more or less uh, predominant. It is very uh, natural for a Western contemporary human being 
to present himself or herself through the face. But is this a universal feature of humanity? Or is, uh, on the contrary, a feature that itself derives from a certain cultural um, history and cultural evolution? Uh, we're going to talk, uh, hopefully, during these seminaries, also of uh, the very uh, important philosophical debate, one of the most important philosophical debates of the 20th century, this philosophical debate was exactly around the face, the philosophical value of the face. On the one hand, you have a important, very important uh, Lithuanian philosopher who started to uh, write predominantly in French uh, and became, became a French citizen after the Shoah um, because he was a Jewish uh, uh, intellectual and philosopher, a native of Lithuania, Emmanuel Levinas. Emmanuel Levinas, in a um, masterpiece of the history of philosophy of the 20th century, Totalité et Infini, Totality and Infinity, declared that the most important, uh, I would say, interface in order to uh, prove your humanity, but also in order to receive the humanity of the other, is what it will call the visage, the visage. The visage is not exactly like the face, because it is a sort of philosophical, phenomenological um, counterpart of the face. But the uh, insight of Levinas was a consequence of the experience in uh, death camps during the Second World War. Uh, the experience that it is impossible to look at another human being in the face and not to recognize another human being. So, the recognition of another human being, the recognition of the otherness and also of the sacrality, the sacredness of the other human being derives phenomenologically also from the fact that this human being, being presents himself or herself as a face. And Levinas uh, posits a very important distinction between a face and a facade. Facade in English and French is facciata. Buildings as well have a face that we call not faccia, but facciata. What is the difference between a faccia and a facciata? A face and a facade, a visage and a facade. What is the difference between a face and a facade? Una faccia e una facciata. Una facciata è costruita. A facade is built up, is artificial, but uh, isn't there a certain artificiality also in the way in which we propose our face? But the facade is an element. Hmm? The, the facade is an element. The facade is also an element, yes. There is a certain motility in our face, but uh, nevertheless, even when we look at the picture of a face, of a human face, we usually recognize that this face, although is a still one, is still not a facade we can still recognize that uh, it doesn't work phenomenologically like the picture of the facade of Notre Dame. Okay. We can... Because it is an element. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just that it's moving, it's that you suppose the conscious, the language, you suppose the, the living, mm -hmm. the living being. Like. Yeah. yeah, this is exactly the point of Levinas. Levinas uh, would claim that I can appropriate a facade, I can... Um, in a way, <clears throat> uh, turn this facade into an object, an object that becomes mine, that becomes mine in perception. But I, I cannot really appropriate a face in the same way. I cannot phenomenologically treat a face like a facade, because that face, your faces for instance, will always somehow escape me. Even the face of a lover, even the face of your husband, your wife, your mother, your father. Will always <clears throat> somehow escape you because it is the interface not of an object like the facade of a cathedral, but it is the interface of another subject. So you recognize that there is another subject there, and by recognizing that there is another subject there, you also posit your own subjectivity. So, according to Levinas, uh, being always able to recognize the face of the other as a visage and not as a facade, 
is a fundament of humanity. If that fundament um, is somehow thwarted or deleted, if I start seeing another human being not as someone provided with a face, but as someone who has a body without a face, then I'm starting to see uh, that human being is an object without its own, his own, her own subjectivity. Uh, then I can dispose of that, of that object, then I can kill that object in a concentration camp, in a death camp, for instance. Now, another important philosopher of the 20th century, <coughs> Jacques Derrida, uh, tried not to criticize, but to continue the philosophical trend started by Emmanuel Levinas. And Jacques Derrida would uh, somehow try to enlarge the philosophical view of Levinas. According to Levinas, we can attribute a subjectivity and therefore a humanity through the phenomenological perception of a visage to another human being. But Jacques Derrida would ask himself, what happens when I'm naked in my bathroom and my cat sees me and stares at me and I stare at my cat? Is that a phenomenological experience that is similar to the phenomenological experience of looking and staring at the face of another human being. Now, the reflection of the Vida is very complicated, as always. But the point, the main point is, this phenomenological dimension of the visage, of the face as um, a main existential interface of human beings, can be extended to uh, non-human living beings. When I look at my dog, when I look at my cat, do I see a face? Do I actually project a subjectivity into and behind that face? Because that has um, not only a philosophical but also an ethical uh, aspect attached to it. Um, if I recognize the fact that I see a subject behind and through that face, the face of an animal, the face of a cat, the face of a cow, the face of a pig, um, can I dispose of those bodies? Can I treat them as objects? Or uh, uh, must I, on the contrary, posit their subjectivity and uh, uh, stop appropriating their bodies as if they were mere things? That we can understand what the consequences <coughs> are in terms of um, ethics, uh, of uh, um, uh, non human animal uh, rights, and so on and so forth. But you can extend that idea, and that has it, um, even farther, can I actually see a face also attributed to elements and, uh, let's say, counterparts in my environment that not only are not humans, but are not um, living beings either, or at least they are not animal living beings. Uh, can I attribute a visage to a plant, to a flower? Can I look at a plant and treat that plant as if that plant had a visage, and not simply a facade, like a cathedral? Or can I look at a natural landscape and see that uh, behind that landscape there is something that moves, uh, that acts, that exists in a way that is similar to what is behind the face? So can I somehow humanize through the projection of this visage uh, things that are not human, that are not animal, that are not living. This is the first part of the dialectics. The second part of the dialectics is in a classic of uh, 20th century philosophy uh, that has been uh, 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 published by two major uh, French uh, philosophers and psychoanalysts, uh, Gilles Deleuze and um, Félix Batteri. Uh, the um, uh, uh, book is called A Mille Plateaux in uh, French, A Thousand Plateaux uh, in English. And in a passage, very important passage of A Thousand Plateaux, Deleuze and Gattari uh, underline the fact that this approach of Linus that might seem universal and universalistic that might seem 
able to embrace the totality of humanity through this very abstract philosophical concept of the visage, uh, in reality it is not so, because Levinas was, according to Deleuze and Gattery, influenced by a certain visual imaginary that is typical of the Western visual history that tends to attribute an enormous importance to the frontal presentation of the face as a um, main, as a, uh, a paramount interface of subjectivity. And the lesson Gattery tried to come up with a uh, very risky, but at the same time very interesting genealogy of this um, uh, cultural bias. So why, this is the question that Guattari and, uh, and Deleuze asked themselves, why is it so that to be attributed such a philosophical, phenomenological, existential importance to the human face? Um, Felix Guattari and Jacques and Gilles Deleuze would claim that uh, we shouldn't focus only on the uh, Levinasian category of the visage, but also on what they would call, uh, with a French term, la visagente. What is it, the visagente? Well, uh, by using this term, deriving from visage, but with the suffix ite, visagente, Deleuze and Guattari um, argue that we are not only recognizing uh, other subjectivities through their faces, we are also implicitly adhering to a normative perception of these faces. So by adopting the face as the main interface, as the main um, uh, phenomenological uh, uh, lieu where we recognize and we posit the subjectivity of the others, we are somehow yielding to a cultural bias. And this cultural bias, according to the Reza Bertani, this is a very risky hypothesis, but it's a very fascinating one, derives by the fact that the religion that has most influenced the Western civilization represents its transcendence, its gods, in a very particular way. What is this way? What is the most influential religion uh, as far as the Western uh, culture is concerned. But it is undoubtedly Christianity. And how is it that Christianity represents transcendence? <coughs> how is it that Christians represent transcendence? First of all, they represent it all the time. They decide, not intentionally, but culturally, to represent transcendence over and over again. But they also choose, again, not intentionally but culturally, to represent transcendence through a face. And what is it, this face, that represents transcendence for Christians? That's the face of Jesus. The face of Jesus is everywhere in Christian iconography, is everywhere in Christian religion, is everywhere in the history of this religion and the impact it has had on the Western civilization. So, the hypothesis of the losing battery, a very risky one, again, I underline, um, is that since for centuries we have represented transcendence, we meaning Westerners, Christians, uh, Westerners influenced by Christianity and so on and so forth, we have represented transcendence as endowed with a face. We have represented transcendence as incarnated into a body. And we have represented the body mainly as a face, as a frontal face, as a Christ that looks at us and stares at us and responds to us through a face. Then we have been somehow pushed to attribute an enormous phenomenological importance, existential importance, to the visage, to the fact of recognizing others through that basis. Uh, now something, a question that we are going to try to um, deal with during this seminar is whether this hypothesis, uh, uh, well I wouldn't say it's true or false, but is um, uh, 
uh, useful in order to understand the meaning of the faith in contemporary cultures. And I go back to my first questions. So how is it that the meaning of the faith has changed in present day cultures? For instance, in the culture of today, as compared as the visual culture of even 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Someone said, uh, yes, uh, there is a um, uh, photograph now that uh, crystallizes the image of the face. But this is something that human beings have done with the iconography of the face since antiquity. You know what is the uh, starting myth of the history of painting in the Western civilization for the Greeks? I don't know whether I've told you already or whether someone else has told you how the Greeks and how the Western civilization have imagined, mythically imagined, the origin of painting. How is it and why painting started as a human practice? What is it, the origin of paintings, according to the It is told in this fantastic um, um, work by Pline the Elder, Pline il Vecchio, Natural in which all these foundational myths, myth information of the arts and other activities of human beings have been collected and uh, told and described. So what is it according to Pliny the Elder, the myth of foundation of painting in the Western civilization? There was a potter, someone who would make pottery, in vasaglio. And this father had a daughter. And this daughter had a boyfriend. And this boyfriend was going to war. He might never return again. He might die in war. It was very likely, it was very probable at that time that someone would not turn, return alive from the war. And the daughter of the father was indeed distressed. She was desperate. She was desperate because she uh, was fearing that he, she would never see uh, her boyfriend again. So what does the father do? Well, while the boyfriend is still there, he sees the shadow of the profile of the silhouette of the face of the boyfriend on a wall, takes a chalk and traces this silhouette on a wall. And this is the invention of painting, according to a Greek myth. The invention of painting is connected with the idea that someone that you love might disappear forever. It is connected with love, and it is connected with death. Of course, there are many ways of interpreting this myth, but uh, a uh, very interesting way of interpreting this myth is to connect the history of painting, but also the history of every visual device for representing the human face and the human body with this deep fear of uh, the passage from existence to non-existence, from life to death, and uh, with this idea of wanting to keep a trace of a human being that might disappear, a trace that semiotically works not as a symbol. The potter doesn't uh, ask the boyfriend to leave a letter, a letter of love for the girlfriend. Um, the potter doesn't ask him to uh, uh, imprint uh, the print of his hand on sand or on other uh, materials. So it is not a symbol, symbolical signification that is used to somehow counter the idea of death. It is not an indexical signification that is used to counter the idea of death. It is an iconic signification. It is a resemblance. What counters the idea of death, the death of a loved person, is the possibility of building what some magicians call a simulacrum of that person that works iconically, so that works through resemblance between that body and the image of that body. That is the origin of painting according to the Greek myth.
uh, of its foundation. Now, according to you, is, is this myth still valid nowadays? Nowadays, is there a relation between the profile that is uh, outlined by the potter on a wall many centuries before Christ in order to soothe the pain of this girl? and the profile picture of our Facebook account. Sì. What is it in common? In common, I think, is the fact that certainly the times are quite different. But in this flux, incessant, poco governable, the individual decides to perimetrate his own identity with a photo. Quindi più e più foto per cercare di, uh, sì, cercare di incorniciarsi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there is something that is uh, inexorably uh, connected with uh, uh, the fear of death, the fear of disappearing. Uh, it is not the fear of disappearing, it is not of the fear of disappearing uh, only biologically, but it's also the fear of disappearing existentially. Um, we might hypothesize, but we will work on it, that many of our iconic statements, and especially many of our iconic statements about our faith in the digital networks, in digital communication networks nowadays, are also connected with a certain fear of disappearing, of not being existent. For the others anymore. Please, there was a, a comment. Mm, I think that the moment is that uh, we are around that we become, uh, we promote our faith and uh, we write something about our life uh, to involve our people and uh, we sell ourselves. <coughs> so I think that we. There is not a difference between uh, we don't like brand and uh, art. We certainly do. Uh, we must understand uh, how precisely. So, uh, my point is that there are some uh, biological features of the face that uh, are part of the human species since its emergence in the history of evolution. Aridolia, for instance, is one of them. There are some very long trends in cultural history. We still use uh, facial icons as a sort of an antidote to disappearing and death, even nowadays in certain circumstances. But what we uh, should ask ourselves is an initial question, what has deeply changed nowadays? What is deeply different about uh, the face and the icons of the face that circulate around us, in our semisphere, day by day, day after day. What is radically new? What was not there 10 years ago, for instance, or five years ago? What is particularly uh, salient? Forse, paradossalmente, oggi come oggi, il volto è diventato un tipo di non simulato, più di prima, quindi ha assunto il valore, il valore quasi, quasi sacro, sembra, non so, sembra sciocco dirlo, ma all'interno di, di una dimensione come quella di Facebook credo ci sia, eh, credo abbia assunto un'accezione quasi sacra il volto, il volto ha, non so come dirlo, però ha assunto comunque una, un livello abbastanza well, this is, this is very important, but it's also a consequence of something that is uh, uh, much, uh, in a way, much simpler to identify. Let's stay for a moment at the quantitative level. Do you think that the number of faces uh, to which we come in contact with, which we come in contact with day by day, has increased or has decreased in relation to the past. Do we see more faces? I'm talking not about real faces in the real ontology of, uh, let's say, face-to-face -face interaction. I'm talking about icons of faces. Do we see more or less, more or fewer icons 
of faces in our daily life nowadays than, let's say, 10 years ago. More. Yeah, this is, uh, this is probably true both ways. We use much more um, uh, digital icons of, uh, uh, of our face or faces or faces representing our emotions somehow to express ourselves but we also receive an enormous amount of um, uh, icon, digital icons of faces every day. Every day, if we go through social networks, if we go, uh, uh, if we surf the internet, if we visit websites and so on and so forth, we are constantly exposed to hundreds, if not thousands, of faces every day. Now, how do these faces look to us? How do these faces look? What is the appearance of these faces? Please. La quantità di visi e l'uso che ne facciamo sembra il contrario di come diceva il collega, cioè diventano non sono più proprietà di qualcuno, ma sono solo modi di significare qualcosa. Da questo punto di vista sono dissagrate le facce. Prima eh, il profilo della persona amata era in qualche modo la persona amata, quello era sacro. Adesso invece l'emoticon non è forse neanche più ciò che significa. Siamo mongosamente attratti. Adesso va di moda a sgamare le photoshoppate, eh, cioè svelare come l'apparenza non è reale. E quindi c'è questo mito dell'irrealtà dell'apparenza e poi bisogna indagare cosa significa per noi questa morbosa attrazione per ciò che sembra e non è ma sicuramente siamo attratti da ciò che sembra non più da ciò che è a prescindere che possono coincidere a noi I mean there are these two tendencies although they appear as contradictory you are both right according to me um, the face nowadays is uh, tending to be everything but at the same, thing, at the same time it is tending to be nothing it is everything and it is nothing at the same time this is the big paradox in our, our days. This is the paradox that we want to explore. Um, the face is nothing because there is an enormous amount of faces all around us. The quantitative amount of faces is huge. First of all, quantitative dimension. But also, uh, these faces and the enormous quantity of these faces is pervasive. These, these faces are everywhere. These faces are, for instance, uh, in a glass window. Uh, the faces are on the CV that we present in a company for a job interview. Uh, we present ourselves with faces every stupid, the most stupidest social network or website uh, asks us to upload a profile picture. <coughs> as if we couldn't exist on these websites, in these social networks, without being recognized through a face. So, Quantity, a quantity of um, uh, faces, uh, digital icons of faces everywhere. We not only uh, see them, circulate them all around us, but we can also store them in your uh, smartphones. Probably now there are thousands and thousands of faces, although you don't realize them. You don't realize it. There are thousands of faces. <coughs> now, who could? For instance, up to, let's say, even the 1980s, 1990s, store thousands and thousands of icons of faces. Could a private do that? Could a company do that? Probably only the state would do that. Only the police services would do that. Only the CIA would have a, an extensive collection of icons of faces uh, stored somehow at its disposal. Now, everyone in the smartphone has thousands of icons of faces associated with names, with phone numbers, and so on and so forth. So, enormous quantity, enormous pervasiveness, um, enormous ability to store these images, but there is also another aspect that things we do with these faces have changed at a very basic level. Uh, I was very touched by an interview 
that former president of the Republic, uh, uh, Italian Republic, Carlo Zedio Ciampi, gave uh, some years ago. Um, and it was a, like a pleasant uh, comment about the fact that these, um, um, these uh, makeup specialists was putting some makeup on his face uh, before he would give the presidential speech. And so Trampy uh, said to this, um, this girl, it was a girl, you know, you are the second girl in my life that touches my face after my wife. Now we're constantly touching faces. Not real faces, but we are so used to touch um, digital icons of uh, other people's faces, even if we don't know them. Now, this seems totally natural to us, but in the long term, this is transforming something that, for Levinas, for instance, was at the same time an interface, but also a sort of a um, uh, shell protect, protecting and um, outlining uh, and sheltering at the same time an average subjectivity. I wouldn't touch your face. I, would, I wouldn't touch your face in real life. That would be uh, absolutely absurd. And only in moments of violent confrontations or in moments of affection you touch another, people, another person's face. This happens when there is either intimacy between two people or there is conflict between two people. Otherwise, it is something that is uh, sacred, in a way. So, quantity, pervasiveness, uh, things that we do with, uh, with a digital icon of faces. Think about the function of Tinder. You know, if you don't have a Tinder account, please open one. Even if you <laughs> no, seriously, even if you don't, if you are not interested in the service, but please open a Tinder account. Just. Uh, in, in order to, of course, try it not to jeopardize <laughs> your personal relations. So ask, tell your, your boyfriend or your girlfriend that it's just for semiotic purposes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but open a Tinder account and, um, and try to analytically witness how this app works. Now, you are constantly bombarded with faces uh, of other men, of other women, of both men and women, and what you do is just to touch the face. You know, and by this touching of the face, you either uh, approve them or you discard them. You, know, you just have these two one zero binary, um, uh, typically uh, typical code of information sciences that is applied to cultural, to emotional, sentimental relations. So there is another element that has somehow turned uh, the face into nothingness. Quantity, pervasiveness, uh, uh, materiality of our relaxed relation with the face, but also uh, things that we can <coughs> do in order to modify our faces. What is the cultural meaning of Snapchat? Why are we so fond of Snapchat? Why do we um, uh, draw pleasure from so heavily digitally modifying in such cartoonish way uh, the digital icons of our faces? More generally, we are uh, in the possibility of modifying the appearance of our faces in a way that is as well unprecedented. Uh, we have always, as human beings, manifested a tendency to not only show this interface and use it for communication, but also to alter it, modify it in many different ways. Now, how can we help alter our face? You know, we, we start with this question again, because it's also semiotically very important, and all the seminars that will come after, they talk about different ways of our, that, that human beings can rely on in order to change the appearance and the meaning of the so what can we do with our faces? We can uh, hide our faces or show our faces, we have said, but other things we can do in order to modify the meaning, the aesthetics, the appearance, and therefore the communication project of our faces. 
what can we do in our, let's say, real life, uh, with our bodies, with our um, uh, ontological faces? Basis of the system is like what you're in down for the You can smile, you can frown, mm -hmm. you can raise your eyebrows. For instance, we can express emotions, uh, we can fake emotions as well. I can be you know, smiling and at the same time, you know, hating you. <laughs> uh, not, not all can be faked. You know, this is something that we know from Darwin on. You know, blushing, for instance, rossore, uh, la rossimento can be faked. So, Again, nature and culture. I can fake a smile, but I cannot unblush. So if I'm examined by my professor and I start blushing from here, you know, the stars start up, up, up. No, I cannot contrast that. It's part of nature, not of culture. So, emotions. I can display certain emotions. I can show them according to certain patterns that are not only natural, of course. You know, we smile, and this is probably something that we uh, uh, get from a long period uh, cultural but also natural history, but uh, the fact that we can pouch, no? mettere la bocca a policino, is long translation for pouch. The pouch in pictures is a radically new thing. It's a new way of expressing emotions that derives from the influence of certain uh, trends and uh, circuits in the entertainment uh, global industry, the pouch. So, emotions, what else we can do with our face to change it? To turn it into a semiotic device. Piercing. Yeah, for instance, we can tattoo it. Uh, uh, I had a very interesting experience uh, uh, well, when I was in um, Berlin with Gianmarco uh, uh, and Bruno, we were at a congress, and uh, um, and so after dinner we had dinner together, and uh, um, the doctoral students are very serious, so they went back to study. But I went to a club, and um, in this club, because I'm a little bit insomnia, but I went to a club and I was with my suit and tie, and uh, and all of a sudden it was very late. It was like two or three. It was alone, and this um, this bunch of young people came in. Uh, it was a, a special night. It was a Latino dance uh, music uh, night, and all these people, young people between probably 17 and 20, like a bunch of them, like 10 or 15, they all had tattoos on their faces. So they look at me because I was the monster <laughs> there. Uh, <laughs> what are you doing there with your tie, you know, your suit? You know? Say, so don't worry, guys. I'm professors. And <laughs> but at the same time, uh, you can't tattoo, tattoo even your face. And uh, there are codes, there are uh, rules, there are laws, um, there are uh, connotations. Uh, I mean, it is very rare still nowadays that someone tattoos his or her face. Uh, it is not something common, it's still something marginal in, in society. It doesn't mean uh, let's say, push toward the center of the hemisphere like other tattoos. Now, many young people now have tattoos, but uh, very few of them would accept to permanently modify the meaning of the face. Exactly because the face is something different that uh, my forearm, my buttock, my foot, and so on and so forth. So before I modify permanently my face, well, probably, I'll think it twice. Most things that we do to modify our faces are not permanent. Exactly because we, we think deep down that our face is something somehow sacred. And uh, before I modify it permanently, uh, well, I think about it. It is a deep modification of my identity, the identity that I present to other people. But certainly, tattooing, piercing, scarification, plastic surgery, plastic surgery even aggressive plastic surgery. Uh, again, some years ago, uh, in a pub in Germany, I, I saw this, this guy who had these two horns that had been uh, uh, inserted as prosthesis uh, uh, underneath the skin. And it was quite, uh, I mean, um, artists, contemporary artists like Cindy Sherman, for instance, they constantly work 
of this kind of uh, transformation of the face. But something that uh, modifies uh, the face, the human uh, face, since antiquity, something very simple. What is it? Makeup. But makeup is something that we know since antiquity. You know? Ovid uh, wrote a treatise on the makeup of women, and uh, uh, there is a huge, enormous uh, industry uh, concerning makeup, uh, fashion, hair. Uh, what else? Mutilation as well. Hmm? Mutilation, Mutilation well. more extreme. What else? What else is there to modify the meaning of our face? Modifying the edges, for example, the hair. Mm -hmm. yes. changes the frame of the face. Absolutely. Changes By changing the hair, cat, I also modify the perception, mostly, of my face. Um, again, I can uh, uh, wear some, uh, some gadgets, I can wear some eyeglasses, a monocle, uh, other objects of this kind, and so on and so forth. But what is unprecedented <coughs> is the ability that is now given to us to modify the um, uh, digital icon of my face. Before the invention of digital uh, photograph, I could of course modify uh, the image of a face. It was very common to add some mustache you know, and uh, uh, analogic photograph of someone I wouldn't like. But today, I can completely transform my face. And this ability to completely transform my face is given to everyone. You have it in your smartphones. What are the very simple ways in which I can transform the digital icon of my face? That everybody can use and knows how to use uh, in a smartphone. Uh, for instance, I can use filters in order to transform the lighting through which my face uh, is perceived. Uh, or I can also resort to software that uh, gives me some uh, predetermined uh, formula in order to modify and transform my face. So Snapchat, for instance, uh, I can transform my face. My face is still there. If it wasn't there, if it wasn't recognizable, then Snapchat would work. Snapchat works because people who are going to see my transformed face will recognize me, but they will also recognize that this face is deeply transformed. My cousin uh, uh, recently had a baby, and uh, my younger cousin is, is babysitting him, and you know, she spends the entire time taking snapshot selfies with this baby. You know, and then I receive. I cannot ever see a real picture of this baby because it's always with insects, with uh, stars, with everything. But, but at the same time, this is a very common phenomenon. But we should ask ourselves, first of all, what is the cultural meaning of them? And second, what is the cause of the cause of these behaviors, but also the effect of these behaviors? What is going to happen to our ways of perceiving and interacting with faces um, given this enormous quantity, pervasiveness, aptic relation to faces, possibility of modifying them, uh, what is going to happen to faces? You see, uh, one uh, very important issue that we're going to deal with is the issue of empathy. The face is also a fundamental interface of empathy of being able to recognize the emotions of another person, but not only recognizing the emotions of another person, but also feeling a sort of a simulacrum of those emotions in my own body. I see that you are crying, I see it from your face, and I feel sad. And I feel sad exactly because I've seen your face. Now, big question. Is the fact that we are exposed to thousands of faces, and these faces are deeply formatted, these faces become icons, is it in the long term modifying also our ability to treat faces not only cognitively, but also emotionally, to prove um, and feel empathy toward other people's faces? Is the fact that they can discard icons of faces on, on a Tinder um, like hundreds every day, 
uh, going to affect the way in which I give an importance to the face of the other, to the singularity of that face. <coughs> so the face is maybe in certain contexts becoming nothing, but is also becoming everything. It is becoming everything because it is a fundamental place for the expression of our narcissus, of our identity, of our belonging. It is becoming everything also from a commercial point of view. Um, having a grasp of a uh, big data repertory of uh, depository of millions of faces will give in the future enormous power to those who will have those digital icons of faces, but will have also new instruments to turn those faces into information, into marketing information, into political information, into military information. How can we turn digital icons of faces into useful information? What instruments can we rely on models to do that? Well, maybe identification systems? Well, certainly identification system. You know, currently the CIA, the Secret Service of the United States have an enormous uh, uh, database of uh, digital face icons, uh, more than uh, 90 million, that are used in order to, for instance, uh, secure the frontiers of uh, the, the nation, the United States. When you go, when you travel to the United States, uh, you uh, used to give your uh, fingerprints, you still do. You used to have your um, iris red automatically, you still do. But more and more, it is a software of facial recognition that <coughs> treats your face, that recognizes your face, and uh, associates that recognition with a series of data concerning your civil identity, who you are. This is uh, uh, gold. You don't realize it, but facial recognition, automatic facial recognition, is gold. It's gold. It's just, it's just a new gold mine of the 21st century. Just imagine if a software and we still have, we already have the technology to do that. Just imagine whether <coughs> we might have a device and software able to recognize your face in the street while you walk in front of Louis Vuitton and associate this face not only to your civil identity but also to your taste, for instance. And to change um, the offer, the marketing, uh, the visual um, display of the glass window according to this recognition. Now you are recognized mainly through a series of data that do not concern your body. Amazon may be a little bit um, even intrusive and look a little bit intrusive and a little bit annoying when it keeps proposing you, for instance, you know, I, I love running, you know, I love math and running. But I don't like the fact that Amazon constantly and Facebook constantly um, propose me shoes to buy. You know, like I buy a pair of shoes you know, per year and I consume them. And I'm not going to you know, need all this information all the time. But still, it is not through a knowledge of my body that Amazon proposes this customized marketing information to me. It is on the basis of data of uh, digital footprint, technically it is called, that I've left in the internet. But another thing would be whether my computer, uh, through its camera, uh, sees a, um, an image of my face, turns it into uh, recognition of my identity, and uh, somehow connects not to my digital footprint, but to my biological, natural, physical appearance, a series of parameters and information. <coughs> now, I'm going to conclude
but of course this is just the opening of our seminary, to um, uh, the brilliant, uh, provocative uh, creations of this American artist of uh, evident Italian origin called Leonardo Selvaggio. Have you ever heard of him? Leonardo Selvaggio has come up with this mask. Uh, called URME uh, Surveillance, which, I quote, is a subversive intervention that protects the public from facial recognition surveillance systems in a variety of ways. The principal method is by inviting the public to wear a photorealistic 3D printed prosthetic of my face. So the artist is giving his own face to everyone as a protection against recognition. So he produces these faces, this is the first instrument that he uh, 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 offers to the, <coughs> the general audience so that these systems of facial, software facial recognitions do not recognize actual identities but recognize always him, the artist. Uh, there is something deeply narcissistic about it. Um, then of course there is some irony and some provocation. A second device is um, and not the uh, 3D uh, uh, prosthetic, which is expensive, but a 3D <coughs> printed and photorealistic mask on my face. You can wear a printed paper mask of this artist's face and be recognized as this artist when you travel, when you are on the street, when you are in a bank, and so on and so forth. And the third device is, I'll show it to you in a GIF, GIF, this software that is able to uh, replace up to five faces uh, appearing in a video whatsoever with the realistic um, face of the artist itself because facial recognition is not something that applies nowadays only to real faces in life it applies also to photographs and to videos so of course it's a provocation nobody wants to be recognized as this artist in an airport in the United States or in a bank or in another system, in another place where this uh, recognition, facial recognition system is uh, uh, in use. But what is the statement? What is the provocation of the artist? What does he want to say? Well, he wants to say that probably we should uh, be more and more uh, cautious and uh, worried about the, the, the way in which our face that seems to be nothing becomes everything for uh, commercial, for marketing, but also for security, police, political uh, reasons. If you have a, an entire a political movement nowadays that adopts a <coughs> mask as a symbol and this political movement is anonymous. The point is that uh, uh, you become powerful as a political agency by subtracting uh, your face from the public sphere, and so on and so forth. So, as you can see, the domain of the face is very vast, and uh, we shall um, explore it together during the following weeks, uh, mostly in uh, Italian, don't worry, uh, sometimes also in, uh, in English and with your very important contributions. Now, uh, for the um, day, uh, this is uh, uh, everything that we shall continue next uh, Thursday with the seminar and of course tomorrow with the uh, course of the seminar.